Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Sarah Garner's PhD completion seminar. I'll begin by embracing the spirit of reconciliation and acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout the reach of this uh, virtual meeting and acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd like to give a, a, a brief little introduction to Sarah. Um, some people drive a Volvo along a, a well-traveled bitumen road and Sarah, on the other hand, engineered her own path laden with bumps and obstacles that uh, only a very committed and staunch believer in finding better treatments for patients would endure. What I think drove her was a desire um, not to just prescribe tablets for her patients, but create a, a better tablet. So Sarah is an infectious diseases physician. And um, it was very uncomfortable for her, I suspect, to, to leave that life as being an infectious diseases consultant, pretty much at the, the pinnacle of clinical knowledge, working at hospitals and diagnostic laboratories to pursue a, a pretty new trade in science. And uh, this is not a trivial change in career, but a complete reset for a clinician who gets thrown into the deep end with uh, very few floaties to be able to sustain um, her head above water. So it's not a unique situation in terms of that. I mean, most uh, clinician scientists are faced with that. But what did make Sarah's situation incredibly unique was uh, a pandemic that she had to juggle for an incredibly long period of time. Her, her shifts of caring for COVID-19 patients with her unwavering desire to finish her PhD. Um, Sarah not only um, was able to do this, but she made some pretty amazing discoveries. Uh, and the data was very much instrumental in obtaining a very large NIH grant that shared across Australia and the, and the US to progress um, aspects of her work uh, so that at some stage we will be able to get to clinical trials. Um, so Sarah is now going to share that data uh, with us now. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, thanks, Mark, for that really kind introduction and welcome everyone to my completion seminar. Today I'm going to present my work to you, which is entitled manipulating cell death pathways to promote clearance of HIV. And so as Mark has just told you, um, I'm an infectious diseases clinician, and my experience throughout clinical medicine and as a scientist has really been shaped around HIV. So when I was a medical student, that's when antiretroviral treatments in a combination first became available to the patients. And I've been involved in the HIV sector for over 20 years now. And so through this talk, I hope to be able to um, let you understand a bit about where my passion comes from for HIV medicine. And so to begin the story, I'd like to begin back where it all began, when we first heard about the first cases with HIV. So you can see the date on this slide. It's June the 5th, 1981, which is just over 40 years ago now. So this was a mortality and morbidity weekly report from the CDC, which uh, diagnosed, which showed the first cases of pneumocystis uh, carinii pneumonia, which is now known as pneumocystis gerevichii. So this was found in five young men who were all men who have sex with men, and they were treated for biopsy confirmed fungal pneumonia. And so it was really unknown at this point why these supposed healthy young men would have this condition that's only found in immune compromised patients. And so it was a couple of years after this that HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, was first um, cultured from a lymph node of a, from an HIV positive patient. So why is HIV still important? Well, we know now that HIV can be controlled very well with the current drugs that we have available for treatment, but it can't be cured. And this is because HIV sets up a latent reservoir in the body, which I'll talk about in a moment. HIV still causes significant morbidity and mortality for patients. And the types of morbidity we find in HIV positive patients now, D 
tend to be in excess of certain cancers and also heart disease and stroke and many other things as well. So in the, diet, in the little picture that I've got next to here, this shows HIV activists who have been really instrumental with researchers in really driving the knowledge that we have about HIV and the current medications that we have today. But despite these really amazing and unique partnerships between sufferers and also researchers, after 40 years, why, still we don't, why don't we still have a cure for HIV? So during my talk today, I'd like to go through a few uh, key points. Firstly, I'm going to talk a bit about HIV disease, pathogenesis and treatment. I'll also talk about the key concept of HIV latency and what we know about cure research for HIV so far. I'll talk about the important um, importance between cell death and HIV and how these are balanced within the cell. And also about some drugs called SMAC mimetics that can actually drive cell death and show how these drugs will work in a human immune system mouse model. And then I'll go on to tell you a little bit about future directions for the research that I've presented and combining this with other exciting um, opportunities as well. So HIV causes, as I said, significant morbidity and mortality still for um, HIV positive patients. And so HIV normally enters the body through the genital mucosa it can also infect the body through uh, blood transfusions and also vertical transmission from mother to child. So normally the HIV encounters um, the dendritic cells of the genital mucosa and then is carried through the tissues and also through tissue macrophages to the CD4 T cell, which is the cell that's instrumental in viral replication. So CD4 T cells are really key parts of our immune system and how we recognize pathogens and also how we help to fight pathogens. And so these CD4 T cells are actually um, built up as the viral replication uh, things for HIV in our body. And unfortunately, as time goes on, HIV progressively destroys these cells and patients become severely immune compromised. So there's just a couple of pictures that I've shown here on the slide. So the first is of pneumocystis gerevichiae pneumonia, which I told you is a fungal pneumonia, and then and only infects patients that are severely immune compromised. And patients with HIV in the early days used to die from this condition. In the center here is a CAT scan of the brain, and it shows a lesion of cerebral toxoplasmosis. So toxoplasmosis is a very common parasite which um, infects many humans, but normally doesn't cause severe disease outcomes such as this. Then on the right hand side, there is a picture of CMV or cytomegalovirus retinitis. So this is inflammation at the back of the eye. So again, CMV is a virus that infects a lot of humans and about 85% of our population have encountered this virus before the age of two years old. In a normal immune competent host, the virus is controlled very well. But in patients with immune compromise, it can cause end organ disease, such as the one shown here, and also other conditions such as CMV colitis. In HIV, studies in humans are costly and time consuming, but we wondered whether we could recapitulate what happens in humans in an animal model. And so I'd like to introduce you to my model of human immune system mice. So firstly, we have mouse production, which takes 16 weeks. So we take an immune compromised mouse with a nodskid gamma background. They're sublethally irradiated and injected with human CD4, 34, T, sorry, CD34 positive stem cells. Then the mice are um, allowed to grow normally. And then after 16 weeks, we can check how much of a human immune system these mice have by checking their blood through flow cytometry. If they have a good amount of um, human immune cells, and we need at least 6,000 CD4 T cells for, um, for HIV infection um, to be able to occur, the mice then go on to be transferred to the PCP3 laboratory 
and then infected with HIV. We then allow this infection to occur over three weeks, and then we can bring in treatment for the mice in order to control the HIV infection. So if we can use drugs that are currently used for HIV positive human patients and use them in MASH to feed our mice. And then um, I, I also wanted to be able to show that this model is robust and reflects what happens in the CD4 T cells in humans. So in this graph here, I've shown the CD4 T cell changes that happen in our human immune system mice. And here in the right bottom graph, I've shown you what happens in HIV infection in humans. So with HIV infection, we see that the CD4 T cell count drops when we get infected in humans, and then it rebounds a little bit, but gradually over many, many years, the CD4 T cell count drops and then causes the immune compromised condition that I was discussing earlier. But if we come in with HIV treatment, then the CD4 T cell count will start to rise again. So this has reflected what I found in the human immune system um, mouse model. So at reconstitution, where we check um, how many of the human, um, uh, human cells there are, you can see that the CD4 T cell count is reproduced here. Then we're at, when we're at established infection, which is three weeks later, you can see that the average CD4 T cell count has dropped quite significantly, and this is statistically significant. Then if we give the mice our antiretroviral therapy that's currently available, we can see that eight weeks later, the CD4 T cell count has, has rebounded. So what, is, what happens in the steps of the viral life cycle? And how does our current antiretroviral therapy for HIV work? In this diagram, it shows the HIV life cycle in the CD4 T cell and also the current drug therapy targets that we have. So the, the HIV virion comes along and attaches itself to the CD4 T cell receptor. But in order to be able to enter the cell, it needs to also attach to a, um, a co-receptor. And so most of the time in HIV, this is CCR5, although in the later stages of HIV and AIDS, um, this can also be CXCR4. And currently we have drugs called co-receptor antagonists that are able to block this part of the, of the viral entry. If the virus is then able to enter the cell, it fuses with the cell membrane. And again, we have current drugs available at the moment that can stop this from happening. Once inside the cell, the virus needs to be reverse transcribed by the HIV reverse transcriptase from the viral RNA into DNA. And again, we have NRTIs and NNRTIs that are antiretroviral therapy that can stop this step. Once HIV is reverse transcribed into DNA, there is the important integration step into the, into the DNA of the cell. And so this is important for latency, which I'll talk about later. Again, we have um, newer drugs now called integrase inhibitors that are able to stop this step from happening. Then in the normal cycle of viral replication with HIV, uh, the genes can be expressed and then viral assembly can happen. And then the, viral, the new, newly formed virion can bud off the cell membrane. And then it needs to mature into, sorry, it needs to um, transform into a mature virion in order to infect neighboring CD4 T cells. And again, we have protease inhibitors um, that are antiretroviral drugs at the moment that can stop um, and inhibit this step. So I can show that the antiretroviral therapy that we use that's shown in this model can be used in our human immune system mice in the same way as in humans. So these are the human immune system mice that I've found, uh, I've taken, and the viral set point here is at th three weeks after HIV infection. So you can see here that there's various viral loads, but if we give the mice eight weeks of antiretroviral therapy, we can see at this point that 39 out of the 46 have a suppressed viral load. And the limit of detection for our assay in the lab is 200 copies of HIV per mil. 
we can then see if we give the mice two more weeks of antiretroviral therapy, but then we get to 44 out of the 46 mice that are virally suppressed at week 10. So we know that the model works very well to recapitulate what happens in humans and that we can suppress the viral load for anti with antiretroviral therapy. So this, um, this forms a very elegant model for HIV experiments. But as I mentioned before, we, even with successful antiretroviral therapy, we cannot cure HIV. And the reason that we can't do this is latency. So as I showed you before, HIV can integrate itself into the genome of the cell. And other retroviruses such as HTLV1 and 2 can also do this. I also found it interesting to find out that with ancient viruses, whom we've come into contact with as humans over 10, 000, tens of thousands of years, that about 8% of our current genome is littered with the remnants of these ancient viruses. Latency also occurs in the common uh, herpes viruses, um, such as CMV, as I spoke about earlier, and also with um, glandular fever or EBV virus as well. Although some of these um, viruses set up latency in a different form to HIV, some being episomal. In HIV, latently infected cells can exist in the lymph nodes, the bone marrow, the spleen, and the gut lymphoid tissue, as well as others. And so how is this latent infection actually established in HIV? So the population of the HIV latent reservoir occurs under very specific circumstances. So normally with our CD4 T cells, they receive um, a, an antigen stimulus and then become activated CD4 T cells. After fighting infection, some of these cells will go on to become memory precursor cells and then resting memory CD4 T cells. So the latent reservoir in HIV only happens under very specific circumstances and only about one in one million memory CD4 T cells becomes latently infected with HIV. Out of this one in a million, there's about 97% of these latently infected cells that will have a provirus that's not able to be, um, be able to go on to produce active replication. So it has defects like mutations um, within the provirus. So as I mentioned before with HIV, the viral life cycle normally occurs where the virus enters, integrates, and you get virus gene expression and then virus production. Then at some point in this cycle, the CD4 T cell will die by cytopathic effects of the virus or by immune clearance. But if the cell becomes infected, just as, it's able, just as before it's able to enter a quiescent phase, then this can set up the ideal circumstances for the HIV to be reverse transcribed into the cellular genome before it moves into this resting phase. And these latently infected CD4 T cells can also proliferate in a slow way giving rise to progeny. So this is how the population of the latent reservoir occurs. And as I said before, we know that antiretroviral therapy um, cannot be used to clear HIV. So how are we able to tackle this problem in a different way? So this is where we turn to the cell host processes and stop concentrating so much on what's happening with viral replication. So I was interested in understanding if there were host pathways that could be used to target and abrogate HIV infection. And so we're going to focus on the host instead of the pathogen response in this scenario. So with cell death pathways within the cell, the HIV virus can manipulate them for the survival and for replication of HIV. So there's many cell death pathways and some of them have been studied very well in HIV such as apoptosis. So in this diagram, I'm showing the extrinsic apoptosis pathway, which is the one that I've been interested in throughout my PhD. So we know from previous work in HIV that there's an excess of the cytokine TNF in the serum of HIV positive patients. And this occurs even in patients that have well suppressed viral loads 
on antiretroviral therapy. So in the extrinsic apoptotic pathway, we can either have single signals that dr drive the cell to continue to survive or promote death by apoptosis. So this all occurs from TNF binding to TNF receptor one. And so in, if the pathway is going to go towards survival, the cellular inhibitors of apoptosis proteins drive NF kappa B induction, and this promotes pro-survival gene expression in the cell nucleus. So the gene expression can occur with a few different compounds. But if we come in with um, an endogenous SMAC Diablo or a, a SMAC mimetic, like the drugs that I'm using for my project, we can stop this process from happening. So when we add this drug, then, um, then RIPK1 can be deubiquinated and then can form complex two with caspase eight then caspase 8 can go on to homodimerize and signal to the downstream caspases, caspases 3 and 7, and then this leads to apoptosis of the cell. So interestingly, we've found that HIV can change key parts of this apoptotic machinery. So this shows a Western blot of actively infected uh, HIV cells versus uninfected and mock-infected cells. So I wanted to characterize the TNF pathway in the HIV infected cells and see what the key differences were. So we can see, so in this Western blot, I took uninfected CD4 T cells that have been purified from healthy human hosts and rested them in culture for three days and let, then looked at the protein expression. For the HIV infected cells, once they'd been uh, grown in culture for three days, they were then infected with HIV and then grown in culture for another three days in order for productive infection to occur. So you can see when we look at the differential protein expression between the mock infected cells, uninfected cells and HIV infected cells, that there's key differences in the TNF pathway. So we can see in the HIV infected cells that TNF receptor one is increased and there's also changes in the cellular inhibitors of apoptosis and RIP1. We also see down the bottom here that caspase 8, which is our executioner caspase, is also increased in HIV infected cells. So this Western blot shows us what happens in actively infected cells with HIV, but our hypothesis was that this could happen in latently infected cells as well because active cells go on to be latent, and so they may retain this phenotype. And so this led to the, the main hypothesis for my project, which is can cell death compounds like SMAC mimetics that target the extrinsic apoptotic pathway, drive cell death in the HIV latent reservoir and increase the time to viral rebound. And viral rebound is a really important concept so increased viral rebound is a marker of decreased size of the latent HIV reservoir. And this is quite a robust marker that's been used in many clinical trials as an endpoint. So with my SMAC memetics, I firstly wanted to look at the toxicity, of the toxicity of them in uninfected cells. So again, these are CD4 T cells that have been taken from healthy donors and they've been grown in culture. And then I've used um, differing doses of SMAC mimetic in order to see what happens with cell death. You can see here on the left-hand side of the gra graph that this is our control, and the y-axis represents the amount of cell death that's happening in the culture. So you can see after 24 hours of treatment that our control group has about 3% cell death in the in vitro model, but you can also see pleasingly that the different concentrations we have of the SMAC mimetic actually don't have much difference in the amount of cell death over control. So now how can we use them in our human immune system model to see if they can delay viral rebound and have an effect on the reservoir? So as I discussed before, we have mouse production, infection, and then treatment, and then the treatment phase. So 
you can see with these experiments that they're really long experiments. So they take almost six months for, um, the, the com for completion of the experiment. So firstly, we looked at arinipant, which as a bivalent smack mimetic. And so with the treatment phase, we gave antiretroviral therapy for 10 weeks here. And then we gave berinopant, which is given by intraperitoneal injection thrice weekly for three cycles. At the end of this time, we stopped the antiretroviral therapy and the berinopant treatment, and we looked at measuring the viral rebound in the treatment and control groups. And this is what we found. So just in the corner here, I've got the schematic of the experiment. So at this point here, um, on the y-axis, you can see undetectable viremia here. And so this is where we stopped all of the antiretroviral therapy and our drug of interest. You can see that the vehicle treated mice here, DMSO controls, all had viral rebound within 14 days of uh, stopping all of the drugs. But you can see here that the berinopant infected, the berinopant treated mice had an increased time to viral rebound and that there was still about 20% of mice at the end of four weeks that were yet to, to rebound. But we wondered whether berinopant was the best drug to use in HIV and whether perhaps its activity might be restrained in some way. So we looked at how well it targeted the TNF pathway in different organs. So this is looking at um, the effect of berinopant in the lung, the spleen and the liver. So these are Western blots of tissue lysate from uninfected mice that have been treated with one dose of berinopant. And so in order for us to look at whether berinopant was working in these organs, we looked at cellular inhibitor of apoptosis one. So you can see here in the, so berinopant was given either in um, captazole vehicle or DMSO vehicle. And these are the untreated mice here, just with DMSO. So you can see for the lung lysates that there's actually a decrease in the CIAP1. And that this appears to be sustained out to day seven. And that this also appears to happen in the liver. We can see in the spleen, which is really a key lymphoid organ for where the HIV latent reservoir is, that there looks like there might be a small decrease in CIAP1 at four days, but this does not seem to be sustained. And so we turned our attention to another SMAC mimetic, which we had preliminary data to suggest might penetrate the spleen better. So the LCL161 experiments really formed the key experiments throughout my HIV. So LCL is a monovalent SMAC mimetic versus Brunopant, as I showed you, which is a bivalent SMAC mimetic. So monovalent um, compounds have one AVPI binding motif to the inhibitor of apoptosis proteins, whereas the bivalent ones have two tethered together. And the other advantage of LCL161 is it's orally bioavailable, whereas Brunopant needs to be given intraperitoneally. So you can see here again that we've got our mouse production and infection and then we bring in our treatment. So the mice again were given antiretroviral therapy for 10 weeks, and then we introduced LCL161. And this was given as a single oral gavage once weekly uh, of 400 milligram per kilogram, or the vehicle mice were given the control. So we gave two doses of weekly LCL161, and then we had a rest week in the middle and this is all while continuing standard antiretroviral therapy. And then the mice were given another two weekly doses of LCL161. At the end of this, I continued antiretroviral therapy for the, for the mice for another couple of weeks to make sure they were all virally suppressed. And then I measured viral rebound between zero to 28 days. So this was the in vivo efficacy that I found for LCL161, given as four weekly doses. So again, on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of mice that have a suppressed viral load. And you can see with the vehicle-treated mice that most of these have rebounded by weeks two to three. In red here are the LCL161-treated mice. 
And you can see here that even out to three weeks of the experiment, that 40% of these mice are still to have not virally rebounded yet. We wondered whether ongoing treatments with LCR161 might be able to deplete the reservoir even further and maybe become close, even closer to HIV cure. But unfortunately, we're not able to show really long experiments with LCR161 in the human immune system mouse model, because unfortunately, after a while, the mouse experienced bone marrow failure. And so what about the concerns that we had with Barinopant? Could this be a concern with LCL as well? Well, I did an experiment where I gave animals a single dose of LCL161 or a dose of vehicle. And this was again after giving them antiretroviral therapy for 10 weeks. So you can see that LCL161 does kill T cells, including memory cells in the spleen. So again, you can see the vehicle treated mice in the black here and the LCL161 treated mice in red. And so this, is a, this was a pilot experiment, and so there's just a small amount of mice, but it did give us an idea that LCL was having the desired effect in the spleen. So this seems to represent a viable pathway to purging the latent reservoir, but how much of the latent reservoir would we need to kill for a cure to be possible? So this is a graph produced by mathematical modelling of the percentage of patients with suppressed viral loads after a certain treatment. So you can see the patients that have not had any treatment here, they virally, all of them virally relapse within a couple of weeks. But you can see that as we kill off more log of the latent reservoir, that the time to rebound becomes increasingly longer. And that if we were to able to kill off greater than 10,000 times of the latent reservoir, then maybe patients could cease antiretroviral therapy altogether and have a life without medication. So now I'd like to turn to cure research and what we currently know and what, um, what, ex what cure research already exists in the literature. So for a cure for HIV to be possible, we need to either eliminate the reservoir completely or suppress it. And so this is a picture of Timothy Ray Brown, who was the first patient ever in the world to be cured of HIV. So Timothy was a man who was well, had HIV that was well suppressed for many years. And unfortunately, he developed acute myeloid leukemia and needed a bone marrow transplant. And so his doctors, thankfully having a lot of donors to choose from, managed to find a donor that had a mutation in the CCR5 co-receptor that would make cells resistant to HIV. And so Timothy underwent a bone marrow transplant with this method. And then he had much intensive follow-up over many, many years, and HIV was never able to be found again. And he never needed to be on antiretroviral therapy again either. And so Timothy reflected that I didn't want to be the only person in the world cured of HIV. I wanted other HIV positive patients to join my club. And so Timothy dedicated the rest of his life to promoting cure research. And unfortunately, he passed away last year from relapsed acute myeloid leukemia. But his case is a really fascinating one and shows us that a cure might be possible for HIV, although this was under extreme circumstances. There's there's also been other hopeful cure research that's occurred. And one of these was looking at early therapy. So this is the story of um, the baby called the Mississippi baby, who was born to a HIV positive mother, who was not found to be HIV positive until the time of the baby's birth. So when the baby was born, it was given very intensive antiretroviral therapy, and this continued for about 18 months. And unfortunately, the child was then lost to care. When they re-engaged with care about five months later, they'd been off antiretroviral therapy since that 18 month mark. But surprisingly, the doctors found that the HIV viral load in the child was still below detectable levels. And this actually occurred until two and a half years after this baby had been off antiretroviral therapy. 
at which time, unfortunately, they did relapse. The other main um, side of cure research has been the kick and kin kill models, which use latency reversing agents like HDAC inhibitors. So these are drugs that can be used to reactivate latent cells. And so the thought with this research was that if the, if the cells were reactivated, then they could go on to be killed by cytopathic effects or immune clearance. But unfortunately, this did not occur. And I think we have um, now some really good data to show maybe why this didn't happen. Interestingly, SMAC memetics themselves may cause latency reversal um, in memory CD4 T cells. As they can have autocrine, they can promote autocrine regulation of TNF and NF kappa B signaling before cell death. So again, this was looking at an experiment that I did using one single dose of LCL161 versus vehicle. And you can see here that I'm looking at the copies um, of HIV virus per million CD4. Again, this is just a small pilot experiment. So there was five mice in the vehicle treated group and five in the LCL161 treated group. So you can see that all of the vehicle mice appear to still have quite suppressed viral loads. Whereas there was three mice in the LCL161 um, group that did have a viral blip of a um, of virus in the spleen. So I've talked um, in my experiments about time to viral rebound being a marker of decreasing the latent HIV reservoir size, but are there other ways to measure it a bit more directly? And so there's been various methods trialled over the years in order to be able to, let, to measure the latent reservoir effectively. So the viral outgrowth assays are probably the most well-known um, out of all of the methods, but unfortunately they really underestimate the size of the reservoir. So in this diagram you can see that the true intact proviruses are represented by the yellow circle here and then the other various methods. And the viral outgrowth assay here is represented by the red dot. And then we've got um, uh, some of the PCR methods, including the LUPCR, which I've used for some of my experiments. But this only quantifies um, integrates in gene-rich regions. And so it, it won't truly estimate the size of the latent reservoir. There's then um, T cell activation assays, which again, probably underestimate the size. And then the intact proviral DNA assay, which is the most recent tool that we have to quantify the latent pool and the most accurately accurate to date. So this is a process where it, um, we separately quantify the intact and the defective proviruses by looking at amplicons in the packing signal and also the HIV envelope regions. And so this method can identify about a greater than 90% of intact proviruses. So what have I been able to find in my own experiments? Well, I was able to find in, an, in a small pilot experiment that LCL161 leads to decreased HIV integrated DNA. So again, this was an experiment where I gave a single dose of LCL161 versus vehicle, and then looked at the, at the copies, um, integrated DNA HIV copies per million CD4s. So you can see for the vehicle treated mice that there is mice up the top here who have quite a large amount of the integrated DNA copies, but that the LCL161 mice have a decrease in the in integrated DNA. I've also sent off samples from the LCL161 experiments for the IPDA, which as I mentioned, is the assay that probably best quantifies the latent reservoir. And so I'm going to be interested to get um, those results back. So the experiments I've showed you so far, um, I've shown that pro-optotic compounds that target the extrinsic pathway have promise in HIV cure. But are there other strategies and combinations that we might be able to use as well? And so this brings us to the intrinsic apoptotic pathway that's also linked to the extrinsic apoptotic pathway. And so in this pathway, we get that this can be um, initiated by cell stress, such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy. 
So normally what happens in the pathway for these four cells to survive is that the expression of BCL2 proteins drives NF-kappa B induction and pro-survival gene expression. But if we can block the BCL2 family of proteins with a drug like venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor, then we can have oligomerization of BACs and BAC, which then um, have the mitochondria producing cytochrome C, which leads to formation of the apoptosome and downstream signaling of caspases. And this process then leads to apoptosis. So this pathway in the HIV reservoir have previously be, been explored in our lab from Dr. Aaron Jelovic's work for his PhD. So with Phil's work, he took the human immune system mouse model as well and gave them the drug venetoclax for a total of six cycles. So as I said, venetoclax is inhibitor of the BCL2 protein. So he gave um, three doses a rest week and then three doses of venetoclax again. And then, then again, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing um, the amount, showing the, re the rebound of the viral load. So you can see in these experiments that the vehicle treated mice had all rebounded by seven days, but that the mice that had been given six cycles of venetoclax, some of them didn't rebound until the 28 day mark. So could we target these two cell death pathways simultaneously, perhaps, building on this previous work with venetoclax and also the current work that I've just shown you with LCL161? So would combining these two potentially be additive or maybe even synergistic? And so I again looked at an in vitro culture of uninfected cells and, the, and what these drugs would do to the uninfected cells. So again, this is the percentage of cell death on the y-axis here, and we have a DMSO control. Then we have various concentrations of venetoclax and then combinations of venetoclax given with LCL161. You can see here that the venetoclax only treated cells do have a reasonable amount of cell death, but I wonder whether this might be an artifact of the in vitro assay, as we know that this is well tolerated in humans and doesn't really cause much lymphopenia. But pleasingly, we can see that even with the combinations of drugs, that there isn't really any increased death over the one compound. And so I'm now um, seeking to combine these drugs in the HIS mouse model. And this re really leads me to the experiments that are currently in progress. So in this experiment schema, again, we have mouse production and infection. And then we have our treatment phase. So antiretroviral therapy is started and given for 10 weeks. And then we bring in our drugs of interest, starting with LCL161 and then moving on to venetoclax. So for these experiments, I've be given, been giving LCL161, again, as a weekly dose. So at weeks 11, 13 and 15. And then venetoclax is given by oral garbage, 100 milligram per kilogram in the intervening weeks in 12, 14 and 16. And then the mice are continued on antiretroviral therapy only for another couple of weeks and then viral rebound is measured. And so this is really where I'm up to with projects at the moment. So what are the ways that, what are the future directions that this research could head in? So, and I think this is a really exciting concept because there's many things that we can do with this great model to explore other combinations. So I'd like to continue the LCL venetoclax experiments to really answer that question as to whether the drugs potentially could be additive or synergistic in decreasing the size of the reservoir. I've also started experiments looking at TNF inhibition with the Tanacept. So I really want to see if we stop the TNF pathway from occurring, would we be able to ameliorate the effect of SMAC memetics altogether? There's also, also potential to be able to combine the SMAC memetics with drugs such as the CCR5 antagonist Maraviroc, which does cause some latency reversing action as well in HIV, and potentially combine it with other latency reversing agents as well. And all of the drugs that I've mentioned here and in my research are already drugs that are in human clinical, clinical stage or being used in humans um, at the moment. 
such as venetoclax. So it's really quite easy to be able to translate this work um, into clinical trials in humans. So I've talked to you today about how decreasing the latent reservoir is really the key to finding HIV cure. I've showed you that uh, human immune system mouse model that I've been using, which is an elegant model that can be used to test new treatments for decreasing the reservoir. Cell survival and death pathways are really key in the viral replicative cycle. And we know that, vir that viral proteins can manipulate these to keep cells alive. But we can use SMAC memetics that can target HIV positive cells preferentially in order to be able to, to overcome this and kill these cells. I've been able to show you that the monovalent SMAC memetic LCL161 delays HIV viral rebound and I've also shown that it can decrease integrated HIV DNA. And so there's really many people that I would like to thank as part of my project. So firstly to Mark, who's an absolutely incredible scientist for his ideas and also his really valuable support. To Cody, who was one of my previous supervisors, and also to Phil, who really taught me so much about the key techniques that I've used in my PhD. Also to James and Merle, who have been keen in, uh, sorry, key in producing our human immune system mice. And also a massive thank you to Kathy, who stepped in as one of my co-supervisors in the past year. I'd also like to thank the rest of the Pellegrini crew, especially my fellow PC3 inmates, and also our Divco Stella. To Mel, who's helped in the insectary and the PC3, you've been an incredible help to me and a real support, and especially you've really helped me with the mouse treatments and the general upkeep in the PC3. I'd also like to acknowledge the Scientific Education Office and my PhD committee for their unending help, especially to Keely, Diana and Joe, who were key support supports for me in the tough year that was last year. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my family and friends, especially my wonderful fiance, Andrew, who's been there for me every step of the way. So I'd like to keep, uh, leave you with these key points while I take any questions. So I've talked about how HIV can be controlled, but not cured yet, but cure will eventually be possible for HIV. Cell death and survival are really crucial for the HIV life cycle. And we can use SMAC memetics and other compounds to delay time to viral rebound, which is a marker of a decrease in the latent reservoir. And so I think this body of work taken with the other cure research takes us one step closer to HIV cure. Thank you. Thanks, um, <clears throat> Heaps, Sarah, for a, a very clear presentation and some really cool um, data. Can I ask um, the first question? And that's around some of your data which tended to indicate, um, particularly with venetoclax more so than with the SMAC medics, that you might um, get a reduction in CD4 T cell counts in patients uh, who have got HIV. And I suppose the question really is around um, more of uh, how well they will tolerate this, not, not obviously from a physiological perspective, but more from a sort of mental perspective, because we've been telling uh, HIV infected patients for ever, ever and a day that the CD4 T cell count is just so important, that it has to be high, watch out if it drops. And now we're going to be giving potentially therapies that will be um, dropping their CD4 T cell counts, albeit not by a lot, and presumably they'll rebound. So how do you think something like this as a therapy will be stomached by, by patients? So I've really been able to look at in my work um, what happens with the CD4 T cell count. And what I found when I was doing the, the LCL161 experiments, especially when I was giving prolonged doses, that when I was measuring the CD4 T cell counts of the, both the groups of mice when I was performing viral rebound, that there actually wasn't really a sustained difference in the CD4 T cell count at that point. 
So that's why I thought it was really important to look at that um, experiment that I did just with the one dose, because that really showed at 24 hours that there was that decrease. But I think it's really, I think the important thing to tell patients it, this is this is a really temporary uh, decrease in the CD4 T cell count. And we know that patients that are well maintained on standard antiretroviral therapy, that they'll maintain their CD4 T cell counts well. So I think it would definitely be something for us to warn patients about, because as you said, they're, they're always very worried about it. But it's something that I think is a really temporary drop um, and not anything to really worry about. But I think it would need a bit of counselling. Chris um, asks, uh, do you think that you get a reduction in rebound because there is a specific effect or maybe preferential effect on latently infected cells or because you're just killing off uh, a proportion of, of memory cells and, and they're more sensitive to death and that's what's causing the reduction in HIV rebound? So I think you've almost answered that question by saying that the reduction in, in memory CD4 T cells is, is transient and not sustained, yes. but uh, maybe you'd, you'd like to answer it in, in, in uh, with, with some other information or insight that you have. Um, so I think that I've been able to show, I'm, I know that the data was from actively infected CD4 T cells, but I was really able to show that they do have differences um, in the TNF pathway that would make them more um, preferentially um, sensitised to death, I guess, um, when you look at uninfected cells. So as I said, I know that that is actively infected um, uh, cell data, um, but really um, I think that that um, would probably um, well reflect what's happening in the latent pool as well. And we know from um, other papers looking at, um, I mean, it's a different pathway, but in the intrinsic apoptotic pathway, we know that latently infected cells, um, latently infected cells with HIV do have an increase um, in BCL2 um, over those cells that are uninfected. Cool, thanks for that answer. So Steve Kent asks, well, he says great talk, Sarah, which is um, very nice and uh, well-deserved. The, the mice are treated with um, antiretrovirals for about three months. In humans, this would be much longer. Do you think this would make your smac mimetic treatments more or less effective? Um, so I think that in order for us to have um, a sustained um, reduction in the reservoir in humans, that, as I said, we probably need to be giving these drugs for a really long time. And, you know, the human immune system mouse model is a really great model, but we know that we can't um, keep the, the treatments going on for a very long time. So I think that um, in order for us, and, and we know also with humans, that there's often a really large lag between the time um, that they're diagnosed with HIV, sorry, that the time that they get HIV and then that they have treatment. And so that probably gives them a longer time to have um, quite a big reservoir, unless they're treated really early. So I think that um, it's possible that we could do this in humans, but I really think that we'd need to give um, more treatment cycles in order for it to be effective. Sarah, I'll, I'll follow up, if you don't mind, on Steve's question and ask it in a slightly different way. Um, and I don't know whether Steve was getting to this point or not, but certainly with antiretroviral drugs and even sort of incredibly good combinations, do you think that there's a possibility that there's still some sort of active turnover and it's those cells that SMAC mimetics are killing rather than the, the true latent population. Um, because you certainly showed quite clearly that actively infected cells should be highly, highly susceptible to SMAC mimetics. So do you think that might be confounding the experiments a little bit in that you're killing you know, in mice that aren't completely virally suppressed or you can't detect complete suppression that you, SMAC mimetics might be working primarily to kill actively infected cells over and above latently infected cells? Well, I mean, I think that that is certainly um, a possibility um, to explain some of the data, but I don't think that um, it would explain all of the data. 
And um, what I was really careful to do, I guess, in my experiments is to make sure that I that the mice were virally suppressed before I looked at the rebound of the latent reservoir. And we know that even in patients that do have suppressed viral load, that there is this kind of, um, you know, there is cells that are moving in and out of the reservoir. But I don't think, I mean, looking at the the real increase in time to viral rebound that we have, I, I don't think that that really explains all of it. Mm. Yeah, I would certainly uh, agree. I was just putting you on the on the spot a little bit, and I think that you know, there's there's certainly experiments that you're planning to do, including the IPDA, which will give us some understanding. If you take blood from someone who's um, uh, infected with HIV and reactive reactivate the cells, um, then you'll see a, a surge in virus. But you can also have a look at those cells just in a quiescent state to see how much virus is coming out to really give you a clue as to how much um, virus is coming out in these cultures just because um, there's still some small number of actively infected cells. But I think yeah. you answered the, the, the question um, particularly well, but it's always one that sort of I think of. Um, Andreas asks um, another um, question. Uh, why do you think um, HIV infected CD4 T cells have higher levels of BCL2 the non-infected CD4 T cells, which signaling pathways uh, drive this? Um, so I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. So um, the intrinsic pathway wasn't really the key pathway that I was looking at um, in within my PhD. Um, but I do know, um, as I said before, that there is um, data to show when they've actually taken lately infected HIV CD4 T cells um, and looked at um, the protein expression um, that BCL2 um, is upregulated. So I'm not exactly sure like as to the complete specifics of that, um, but I know that it is a phenomenon that, that we see. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, I can speculate and you can tell me whether you agree, Sarah, but yeah, the, what I would speculate is that for a cell to survive um, viral entry and the initial sort of viral insult, um, most cells die. In fact, we know that the, by far the majority of cells die um, when they're infected with HIV, but obviously some cells don't die. And you figure, well, those cells must have some sort of survival advantage, something that gets them across the line such that the virus doesn't actually kill them. And there's a number of possibilities. One would be that they've got an increased number of pro-survival proteins that allows them to tolerate um, the tickle of virus that would otherwise kill the majority of cells. So that, that's my speculation. I don't know if you agree with that or if you like that idea, Sarah, but uh, I thought it yeah, might I, be a rationale for it. I, th I think it's a good idea. And I think um, one of the reasons why um, it's important to have a look at, you know, not just one pathway, but others, is that, you know, you, have, you might have a population of latently infected cells um, that are really, um, you know, really relying on the extrinsic pathway, but then there might be others that, you know, have upregulated um, important parts of the intrinsic pathway. So I really think that, you know, maybe the, the latent reservoir in HIV is probably quite um, heterogeneous. Totally agree. And a good point for saying that we we may well need more than just SMAC mimetics. You might need the combination of SMACs and venetoclax and, and maybe other things too. But I'll, I'll draw the conversation and questions to a close and I'd just like to really congratulate you Sarah on a, on a really fantastic PhD and I think that uh, we will be able to progress things uh, with the NIH grant and um, hopefully be able to get to clinical trials at some stage so a big thank you and um, heaps of, of claps um, from, from me um, and I'm sure the rest of the audience would agree uh, that it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you.